And welcome back to the Lordy Summer Online. We apologize for that first little delay. We just want to remind everybody that Zoom is not going to replace business travel. But I have, two in- <laughs> <laughs> I have some incredibly special guests joining us um, now. Um, and we did have a third guest. We had Hal Riley was going to join us. Unfortunately, uh, Hal couldn't make it uh, due to a personal circumstance. Uh, but uh, he does promise. Uh, to join us again next time to uh, to make up for it, so uh, we will. Uh, I am sure we'll be able to fill the hour, um, even in uh, even in Hell's absence. The topic today is leaders in loyalty. Uh, a look at advantage through the decades. And just before we start, I just want to thank our sponsors, Sensible, our presenting sponsor for Loyalty Summit Online. Uh, we want to thank them for making Loyalty Summit Online possible, uh, and the rest of our sponsors, our platinum sponsors, Loyalty Partner Solutions, Amia, Engage, Hilton, who is our venue sponsor for Loyalty Summit Americas. Our gold sponsors, Ascender and Maris Motivation, and the Wise Marketer, our media partner. Now, our special guest today, very special guest. First person I want to introduce is Rick Allison, who's the president of the Advantage Loyalty Program at American Airlines. Um, and also joining us is Bob Crandall, who uh, many of you will know is former president and chairman of American Airlines. Um, and Rick has actually graciously um, volunteered uh, or drew the short straw to actually moderate the session um, and, uh, and interview Bob. So this is going to be a fascinating discussion. Uh, the session is sponsored by Radisson Rewards. Um, and on that note, Rick, I'm going to hand over to you um, and take it away. All right. Thank you, David. I am immensely proud to work for a company with a legacy and a culture of leadership and innovation. I, I've been with American for almost 27 years now. And these days, I'm lucky enough to get to show up to work every day at the Robert L. Crandall campus. We, uh, we moved into this building. It's, it's been just about a year and a half ago now. And it is a truly remarkable and impressive facility that has, an, has had an immense impact on the way we work as a company and what we're able to get done. And it is aptly named. To say that Bob Crandall's name is, is held in reverence here is a gross understatement. Bob joined American in 1973, where he would spend the next quarter of a century uh, serving as chairman and CEO from 1985 to 1990, uh, from 1985 to 1998. A very formative period for the industry and a period of remarkable growth for American. Bob is a true aviation pioneer. When, uh, when he retired from American, the Wall Street Journal called him the man who changed the way the world flies. So joining me today, I'm proud to welcome the one and only Bob Crandall. Bob, thank well, you for joining me. It was nice to be here and we look forward to I, I I'm glad you're in the facility. I, you know, covid came along just at the moment we were going to do a, an opening arrangement. And so I've never seen it. But I, one of these no. days, COVID's over and we can fly again. I'll come down and uh, give it you. It, it's fantastic. I'd love to. It, you know, we, we all have things that COVID has upset or interfered with. And for me, the dedication of this building is one of them. Um, and, and I can't help it, Bob, as the holidays approach, I, I was so longing to hear your voice over the intercom in this building. <laughs> for for the old timers, it would have been fantastic. So yeah. so I, I may, maybe I, I would I will take a rain check. I would like that very much. Good. Uh, during your time as the head of AMR and American Airlines, in really quick succession following the deregulation of the airline industry, you launched several technologies, business models that transform the way the, the airline industry operates the world over. And that is not a hyperbole from reservation systems to distribution systems, pricing strategy, yield management systems. I mean, there have been numerous, you know, HBS case studies on each of these, the hub and spoke uh, system and the network effects. And of course, customer engagement strategies like the Advantage Loyalty Program. I, I, I have to ask, what was in the water? <laughs> what, what was it about? the culture of American or the times you're in, do you think that made those sorts of sweeping innovations possible? Well, I think a, a, a whole variety of things, Rick. The, uh, uh, one, of course, is, is uh, just pure terror. And uh, there's an old saying which uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And when I joined American in 1973, the company was in very serious trouble. Uh, it was shrinking dramatically. It had nothing but transcontinental routes, effectively, and airplanes that were equipped to operate transcontinental routes. So we had no choice. If, if we were going to uh, be any better than we had been in, in years past, we had to change rather dramatically. And so we did a whole variety of things, some of which you have enumerated. Among other things, we moved almost immediately from 
New York, where we were headquartered in in those years, down in Dallas, Fort Worth, what, and DF, that's when DFW opened. And so in addition to tearing up the peat patch that is effectively restructuring the entire airline and moving from New York uh, down to Dallas, we had to do as many other things as we could think of. And so we just put our put our heads in the gear and said, well, what do we have to do to be different, uh, do differently than we've done in the past? And we came up with a whole variety of things. I suppose the first thing we did was we used IT much more creatively than many of our competitors did. I had the, the great good fortune to have earlier in my career uh, worked in IT for a while. And as, as a consequence, I think I probably knew more about it than the people who were running <laughs> the other airlines at that, at that particular juncture. And as a consequence, we made uh, a very good use of a lot of data information. Mm -hmm. which allowed us to perceive or come across, come across some truths, if you will, or some, some points of view that were different than those of our competitors. And so we did different things. And then, of course, we got deregulation, and we, we opposed deregulation. But once deregulation happened, uh, we, it's, these are the new rules. Let's go play by the new rules. And we used a lot of the tools that you have enumerated uh, to do better in that new environment. So uh, I think a lot, of things, a lot of things contributed to it, certainly some, some of the, the, the pressure of necessity. Uh, the fact that we had somewhat greater insights into IT and how data could be used. And and we, in, in addition, had the great good fortune as we started to win, we attracted a lot of very young people. And as we attracted young people, because we had shrunk, yeah. and we attracted those young people, we promoted people very rapidly. So we got a reputation as a fine place, uh, an interesting place to work. And that uh, assisted us, of course, the more, you know, as everybody on this call knows, uh, good ideas are rarely the, the, the work of one head. It's the work of many heads. It's the work of a good team. And as we built that team in strength, we got more good ideas. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And you touched on one of the things I wanted to ask you about. I, I remember early in my career hearing that if you want to work in the aviation industry, you should go get a job at American Airlines. That American had a reputation for. Uh, I, I thought I read something one time that said, you know, American was the HBS of, of the aviation industry, that, that the leaders from your executive team then went on to run airlines of half the world. Like, what was you think that about your style, your approach to building an executive team that you think contributed to that success, both, both at American and, and everywhere? Well, I, I, as I said earlier, we, we had attracted a lot of very capable people. But I, I also think to some extent the, the, what we were able to do was, in, in effect, a refutation of something that is now popular. People used to criticize me for being a micromanager. And I was a micromanager. <laughs> I would say to somebody, "Go, please go and do that. And then I would check regularly or review regularly with that person. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. what they were doing. If they were doing well, I'd tell them they did well. And if they were not doing well, I would tell them, you're not doing well, and here's why you're not doing well. Here's what I want you to change. Uh -huh. Now, people say micromanagement isn't a good way to develop people. I don't, I don't agree. Uh, as people, if people are doing a good job, they, they want to be rewarded and recognized and praised for doing that good job. And I think at the same time, People who want to do a good job are happy to have coaching and assistance and help when they know they're not getting it done. Yeah. The consequence is we, we, we had very large, very inclusive uh, meetings, executive meetings every Monday morning where they went on all day. And everybody who was working on a particular project came and joined together and discussed that project and stuff got done. We, we had a reputation of sort of doing endless iterations of the calculation. And I guess that, I guess that was true. Yes. <laughs> we came to the right answer, but we also taught people how to do the analysis. And I suspect that's why they were successful when they went on from a uh, period of time at American to senior positions at other carriers. They took that, that approach with them. 
So I, I am very much inclined to the view that that uh, leadership is is not only about identifying the objective; it is also about helping people reach that objective by providing both criticism and coaching and help along the way. Well, I, I can attest, Bob, to that legacy of being very uh, data driven, uh, quanti- you know, quantitatively focused, and persist is is alive and well. That's good. Um, it's been almost 40 years. Coming up May 1st of next year will be the 40th anniversary of the Advantage program. Originally, we auto-enrolled customers and we took other paper applications at the airport. And we're now up to more than 100 million members. And we, and we still have an impressive number of active concierge key members who were part of that initial batch of enrollees. Even as we sit here today, the airline loyalty programs are are, uh, are valued at more than the airlines that operate them. <laughs> what, what can you tell me? What, and that, that's both, you know, I think a compliment and an indictment all in one. But uh, what can you tell me about the origins of the Advantage program? Where did the where did the concept originate? Well, the concept originated. I think. Look, it, it was hardly a, it was hardly a burst of originality. I think the original thing we did was the methodology, not the idea. But if, in those days, if there's anybody other than me on the call uh, old enough to remember uh, green stamps, uh, in, in, you know, back in the day, in the 60s and the 70s, uh, institutions, grocery stores, banks, anybody that wanted to induce loyalty would hand out uh, green stamps and people would put them into books. And when they had accumulated enough books, they could buy Ginzu knives or, or Ottoman. <laughs> whatever it is they wanted to buy with these books. So the notion of rewarding people for repetitive uh, re- repetitive visits or, or loyalty was, was not a new one. As we looked, as, as we thought about that, because the industry has always been very intensely competitive, and we're thinking about how do we get people to ride on Choose American in every case? Mm-hmm. So we began to do some research and the thing we came across was that people want more than anything else is they want more travel. So we said to ourselves, well, that's a remarkable uh, discovery. In fact, our own product is what people want more of. So, okay, we'll encourage them. How, how can we best encourage them to use American every time? The answer is by rewarding them with more travel on America. Mm-hmm. The original idea was, okay, if we do this, how can we make it easy for our customers and what can we get out of it? And the idea is, look, if if we keep the record, we not only relieve people of the of the requirement that they put stamps in books, mm-hmm. but we'll also build a data file. We'll know all, more about our customers than anybody else knows about their customers. And that will enable us to focus on those people that are most important to us. So we, we structured the thing so that at, when we announced it, we had we had the computers set up so that as you registered for the program, we kept track of the travel. And of course, we knew we knew we had scored a big winner uh, within 48 hours of announcing the program. Every other airline had announced it would match it, but of course, they weren't set up to keep, do the record keeping. Ah. Uh. Thus, during the first 18 to 24 months of the program, American opened up a, a major uh, advantage because it was lot, just a lot easier to keep track of your miles on American than it was to keep track of your miles uh, elsewhere. And, and, and so it was the methodology more than the original idea hmm. that, 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 brought, that, that brought us our early success. And our success. So as time went on, as the program became more all-encompassing and as other airlines signed up and other businesses, banks, grocery stores, funeral parlors, I mean, you have, now you're in charge of that program, so you know you know who buys miles to reward their own customers. We did, in fact, replace the green stamp programs, uh, which, which we had thought about doing and hoped we might one day do, and we, uh, we accomplished that uh, more, more rapidly and to a greater extent than I think we had imagined we might. Well, it, it's been such a successful model for a number of reasons, but you touched, you know, you, you I think um, 
I don't know, stumbled across or designed it with, uh, you, you made an interesting insight a moment ago about the data that you collected. And I, I can't help but reflect on the biggest companies in the world right now are, that's what they're founded upon is, is harvesting and leveraging those personal insights, that data. Yes, I think that's right. And I, I think in, in the, everybody now is into that same thing. And of course, everybody now is concerned about privacy. <laughs> yes. But I think, but I think we had, you know, we, we were perhaps a bit ahead of our time again in thinking if we can build a, a comprehensive file of data about our customers, we'll be ahead of the game. So, so Bob, I don't know if it's the history, you know, we remember the highlights and ignore the, the struggles or the iterations, but, you know, there was, the, truly was an, an, an astounding number of successes in that period. Were there other things you did in that era that were not as successful as, as you had hoped they would have been. Was oh, it, was, did everything turn to gold? I'm sure that I'm sure there were. Uh, I'm sure there were multiple. Uh, but one one that sticks in my mind because there was a particular thing that we tried to do, which I'll share with you, that which which didn't work very well because we hadn't properly analyzed the problem. As we sought to as we sought to grow the airline, we established a hub in Raleigh Durham and another hub in Nashville. And we had, we had laid out the traffic patterns and we thought those hubs would work. And in fact, they were very well received by the public. People would say to us, wow, I really like that new hub you've got in Raleigh, Durham and Nashville. We got it, all the facilities are new, the gates are new, everything works great. And I, so I would say to them, yeah, but why aren't you riding with us? <laughs> and they said to me, well, you know, it's, it was, I do ride with you sometimes, but mostly, I, I go by way of Charlotte. I said, now, why is it that you would fly from where you are in the north to where you are in the south by way of Charlotte rather than using one of our hubs? And the answer was because there's more frequency. That if when an airplane breaks down in the middle of the day, if you're only operating three times a day, you've got a long wait to the next flight. Whereas if there are five flights a day, it's not such a long wait. And out of that came the reality that one of one of the things you need to look at in analyzing competition is the frequency of service. And people would fly by way of Charlotte from the north to the south or the south to the north, principally because uh, they valued the fact that there were five opportunities to do so per day. And in the event of a problem, they could recover more quickly in, in, in an environment where there were five opportunities rather than three opportunities. So we just hadn't Mm -hmm. figured it out properly, which brings you back to the importance of team. Whenever you've got a problem, Mm -hmm. you're going to do something. Do the best you can to understand all of the nuances. Back to the data. You you mentioned that, you know, ideas are best hatched uh, through collaboration, through, through, uh, you know, through that they're a team effort, not an individual exercise. From where do you draw inspiration? You know, what do you what do you do that inspires you? Either uh, that's helpful to your creative, your creativity, your leadership, your humanity. You know, I'm I'm looking for healthy habits, Bob. <laughs> I think we're all looking for healthy habits this period. Well, what healthy, you have the healthy habits. You have to talk to my wife, who makes me eat mostly salads these days. So, <laughs> yeah. Like like every like everybody else, I'm you know I'm on some kind of an exercise machine every morning, and I have a salad for lunch and another salad for dinner. <laughs> and, I read a lot, and I read a lot of history. I must I must confess, healthy healthy habits I think are physical and mental as well. At the moment, I'm I'm uh, they're rereading and you know, reading my way through the the early history of the United States, the Federalist Papers. If you haven't read the Federalist Papers, uh, you ought to. Everybody ought to read the Federalist Papers and, 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 and sort of reread the very early history of the United States, particularly in view of the difficulties, the, the more recent difficulties we've had, uh, where people have wondered about, I mean, we're going to get through this period of time. The second president of the United States, John Adams, speculated openly about becoming a king. All right, we got through John Adams. I hope we'll get through this. <laughs> I like your optimism. Is, is that a favorite period of history, or, or does all history interest you? All history interests me, but I do think the history of the United States is not sufficiently well understood. It's one of the 
great weaknesses of our educational system. We'd be a lot better off if every citizen of the United States knew a lot more about the history of the United States and the institutions that make up our government. Very good. Uh, we, we talked a moment ago about um, the wealth of data that companies collect. And we're in a, we live in a world now where insights are truly individualized as opposed to applied to broad segments. And pricing and promotions could be similar. And, I mean, I kind, of, I kind of feel like individualized pricing is, is where uh, facial recognition was seven or eight years ago, where it's not a question of whether or not it could be done. It's, a, it's more a question of whether or not you can do it well or if you're going to freak people out. You know, you talk about data privacy and concerns. As a pioneer of pricing and yield management technologies and capabilities, what do you think about individualized pricing? Is that something companies should be pursuing? I, David, I, 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 mean, I, I, I honestly don't know. I, I have, there's been a lot of discussion about individualized pricing. It has never been clear to me. I, I, I simply don't perceive uh, how individualized pricing is going to do much good on, on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, if I want to, if I want to go from A to B on the day before Thanksgiving, uh, I'm not quite sure how providing a specific price only for me uh, is going to is going to work either for me or for the vendor. Yeah, I do think that pricing, you know, pricing is one of those things about which the industry, I think, needs to be very careful. There's been a lot of there's been a lot of criticism of uh, people that uh, prices that go up during periods of peak demand. I see nothing wrong with that, so long as the vendor, whoever it may be, whether it's a hotel company, whether it's an airline, you need to be very transparent in your pricing. Particularly if you're talking about loyalty. Now, we're talking about loyalty marketing. And yeah. it seems to me that one of the things that, one of the things that is the very antithesis of loyalty is to be tricky in any way or less than transparent about pricing. Now, that's in both the hotel industry, for example, and the airline industry, I think, are somewhat susceptible to this. Uh, a hotel business, for example, that imposes but does not advertise a facility fee uh, is going to irritate the hell out of its out of its loyal customers who show up mm -hmm. but have not anticipated paying that fee. An airline that does the same kind of thing for mm -hmm. uh, whatever type. Uh, is going to is is going to encounter the same kind of resistance and animosity from their customers. So it does seem to me that if you're talking about loyalty, you got to remember it goes both ways. You want the customer to return on a consistent basis to you. Uh, by the same token, you owe that customer a duty, I think, of consistency and transparency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you you talked you mentioned earlier about how. Uh, when you took on the role as the CEO of, of, of America, of AMR, that uh, you grew from being largely transcontinental routes to a truly global carrier. And, and I've been thinking a lot about growth recently and, and in terms of customer segments as opposed to markets. But loyalty programs tend to care for their most valuable customers, call that the top of the pyramid. And that seems understandable that the people who contribute the most get the most in return but they often neglect to add much value for those who are at the bottom of the pyramid. And, and, and frankly, economics make it challenging to do otherwise. But I'm curious on your thoughts whether or not that's still the right approach, that in today's environment, and, and I get this isn't true for all businesses, but, but for me and for many companies, where a lot of our historical sources of our best customers aren't as active and you're not capacity constrained, do you, is the right approach to double down on re-engaging those customers, or do you shift your attention further down the pyramid and try to grow from the bottom? Where's where's the best opportunity? Do you think? I, David, I, that, that's that's a very difficult question, particularly because none of us really know uh, precisely how travel is going to be impacted by COVID. I, I think a big, a substantial share of business travel will not come back. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, if you think if you break business travel down into different into different segments, a, a piece of business travel is certainly going to persist, and there may be a 
a, a slice at the top that is the people that, that really are the most frequent flyers, people that have to be on the road, that have stayed mm-hmm. on the road to some extent during the COVID uh, crisis, and that will be back on the road consistently, will continue to be people to whom the loyalty programs ought to be carefully focused. <clears throat> on the other hand, I, I think what you're going to find is that that old desire of the public for for, to, for more travel, once COVID's over, I think we'll I think we will collectively find that there is an enormous sort of su- long suppressed demand, and you're going to see people of of all wanting to go. They'll, they'll be back on the road. So there'll be, I think, very strong demand for travel. Generally, perhaps a, 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 a smaller slice of that demand will be directly related to business travel. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I guess, and I guess I, I would answer your question, but it seems lo- likely to me that continuing to focus on those who are out there all the time is likely to be the most rewarding approach. On the other hand, I think it's very important that I, to, for example, there's been a lot of talk about uh, let's let these, some of these miles expire. I think that's a really bad idea. <laughs> if, a really bad idea. If you, if the, the cost of carrying an unsatisfied liability is very mm. small. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is if, if you get some individual, some man, some woman, some family, and they don't have an opportunity to travel very often. But when they do travel, they always travel American or they always travel United, whatever that may be. And over a period of years, they build up. And they finally get to the point where they've got enough miles where they can go take a trip they wouldn't otherwise. Have. Turning around and saying, uh-oh, it's been too long, you can't use it, is a good way to infuriate uh, <laughs> A, a person who has for a long time anticipated realizing the promise uh, associated with the program. So I think, I think not, not only airlines, but hotels and, and others need to be very careful about violating the trust of people who have chosen to participate in the loyalty program. Well, I, I completely agree with you. The liability uh, doesn't concern me. Customers continuing to find value in that currency does. It, 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 it's about people appreciating it and wanting, you know, finding reasons to continue inve- to invest. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, in addition to the health and economic concerns brought on by the pandemic, our nation is struggling with income disparities, racial and social injustice. These aren't new issues, but they've come to the forefront of a national dialogue during this time. And it's, it's amazing to me the disproportionate impact that COVID is having directly on people's health as well as the indirect impacts of unemployment or education, particularly on lower income populations. And this week in the news, you know, the conversation is turning to uh, vaccine availability or how vaccines will be distributed. What what responsibility, Bob, do you think companies have in, in this space? What should we be doing to appeal to customers or connect with our employees who may feel disenfranchised in today's America? Well, David, this... <laughs> This leads us down a political path. Uh, I mean, this is an inherently political question. I, I, I hope it would be a social question, but I, I get well, it. it. Yeah, but it's a, it's a social question, but it is inevitably a political question. Now, look, I, I sh- my own view is that we have two great, two great issues of our time. One is uh, income inequality, income and wealth inequality, and the other is climate change. Climate change is going to, unless we fix the climate problem, the whole world is going to become untenable. Unless we fix the income inequality problem, I think the United States is going to have a hard time hanging on to its democracy. So if if a company, and if a, on the other hand, a company is a collection of assets and people empowered by people with many different social points of view, so I think I think I don't think there's much that a company can responsibly do because it is spending other people's money. So a company I think needs to num- number one focus on being profitable, mm-hmm. and number two fo- focus on on and 
and, and those social values that it can support without becoming overtly political. As an individual, there's a lot more we can do, and there are a lot more that there's a lot that society could require companies to do, and that's the way I think we're going to get this problem fixed. Yeah. So, what what then as individuals should we be doing? Well, as individuals, as individuals, we could be uh, trying to be a lot better educated about what's going on. A lot of a lot of the political problems that we have are the, the reality is that a lot of voters simply do not understand what the issues are. They get a lot of information from Facebook and places like that, where which is not factual, and so. A lot of points of view, a lot of a lot of actions get taken, which are sort of contrary to what the public want. I mean, look, there's a lot of surveys out there that 75 percent of the people in America want everybody to be to have good medical coverage. On the other hand, we've got we've got a political effort to repeal right, coverage that requires covering pre-existing mm-hmm. conditions. Mm-hmm. That, that, the effort to repeal pre-existing condition coverage is contrary to the views of 75% of the American public. That's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well Bob, I know David was going to collect some questions from the audience, but w- while he's doing that, I wanted to I wanted to pepper you with a lightning round. Uh, we'll, 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 see, we'll see how lightning is, but I've got a, a, a half dozen quick questions I, I thought I would... Uh, on a perhaps a little lighter note that I, I would like to ask you. Go ahead. Starting with, uh, what industries do you follow? I follow the uh, aviation industry and not much else. That, that sounds good to me. That sounds good to me. <laughs> what, uh, what or who would you recommend everybody read? Well, I, 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 what, I, I well, as I've as, as I've indicated already, I, I think. Reading a lot about, learning a lot about American history uh, is, is something that every American ought to do. We ought to understand right, who the, what the Supreme Court is, what the Congress is, how they came into existence, how they work, and how we can, how we can best preserve them. Very good. Do you have a favorite destination? A favorite destination. I suppose Paris would be uh, my favorite destination. So, so why, why Paris? <laughs> well, they have uh, lots of pretty girls and lots of nice cafes, <laughs> lots of good wine. So you can sit on, the, sit on, the, on a sunny street in Paris and watch the pretty girls and drink good wine. That, that, for, that. Yeah, for, for someone who lives in Florida, that feels a long ways to go. <laughs> but but I support it. I support everyone going a long ways for to to enjoy their their. Paris is a more attractive urban environment than Florida <laughs> offers. <laughs> um, what's a what's a quality you admire in leaders? Who? I'm sorry. In in leaders, is there a particular quality that you admire? I I admire intellectual capability. I admire honesty, and I admire courage. I mean, you've got to be smart. You've got to be willing to speak the truth, and you've got to be. Brave enough to do what you know should be done. <laughs> I, I like that. I like the last. Um, how long have you and Jan been married? Sixty-five years. I, I, and uh, kudos for not having to pause and think about that at all. Excellent. <laughs> it's one of those things. If you want to stay married for sixty-five years, don't forget when you got married. Well, I, I've, I've never told my wife, but my anniversary date is only two years off my seniority date with American. So it's, it's always it's easy for me to do the math, but I've I've never yeah. revealed that to her. <laughs> do, you, do you have a, a piece of advice for young people on, on if you want to have an enduring relationship? What qualities should you look for in, in a partner, in a spouse? Well, I would certainly I would have, you know, I think it's absolutely essential that if you're going to have a successful long term relationship, you share the same values. Uh, and, 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 you know, you need, well, what do I mean by values? I, 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 you know, I'm an atheist, right? I'm, I don't believe that there's a God, but if I had a, a list of things to live by, it would be the Ten Commandments. So 
I'd say if you, you know, if if you want to marry somebody and they they don't think that all of the Ten Commandments are important, you shouldn't do it. <laughs> I think I, I really do think that shared values are a tremendously important part of life. You, what's important to you had better it should be important to the person you're going to live with the rest of your life. And, and is that something you felt like you knew, or is that something you grew into together? Well, that is something. No, I always knew that. that yeah. I yeah. kind of knew that the day I was born. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, when I was when I was young, my dad encouraged all of I come from a big family and my dad encouraged we could do it we could grow up to be anything we wanted, as long as it was either a doctor or a lawyer. And and I'm sure I disappointed <laughs> him by joining the airline business. Uh what would you recommend to people today exploring careers? Is is there an occupation profession that you would recommend? Well, I look, I think either Either being either a doctor or a lawyer would be fine. Uh, the fact is, I am neither. I I had the great good luck to stumble into a business that I found there both fascinating and challenging and rewarding. So I would say to everybody, whatever it is you want to do, uh, and Lord knows there's I've, I've been having millions and millions of opportunities, but find something to do for a living that is consistent with what you enjoy doing. If you try and do work which you do not like, you're not going to be any good at it. And if you're not any good at it, you're not going to enjoy success. Yeah. So I, th- I think it is tremendously important for people to, to work hard at finding an occupation that, that uh, allows them to do something they like to do. I mean, when I got out of school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I said, look, I, you know, I, I'm a good writer. I like to write. And I, and I like numbers. So how, how can I find a job which, which requires both writing and and, and and I found a job with Eastman Kodak, which required both those both those things. And I enjoyed that job. And I went on from there to do other jobs that I enjoyed. But I went looking for something that matched at my my set of interests and capabilities. <clears throat> and And I think everybody should do that if they. If you find yourself in, in whatever business or occupation or profession, if you like what you're doing, you'll be good at it and you'll probably be successful. It sounds like good advice. Uh, Bob, a final question for you, uh, and it, hopefully an easy one, and, and I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Do you have a favorite Thanksgiving side dish? <laughs> a favorite Thanksgiving side is, is it just salad on Thanksgiving, too? I like, I like, I like, I like the stuffing, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right, David, anything you want to add in our remaining time? Uh, thank you both. I mean, we could fill the entire day with just each of you by yourselves, um, let alone let alone together. Um, th- this is just absolutely fascinating. Bob, uh, Rick sort of stole my, my, my thunder. My first question for you was, I've got a few questions that come in, but, but uh, the people have kind of texted me, but the first question I was going to ask you was about Korea. This isn't the first airline crisis you've seen um, in, in, in your professional career. <laughs> What would you say to people who were thinking about, hey, should, should I be thinking about a career in the airline industry or, you know, is, is it for mugs? Well, of, of course, in, in, from my, my react, my, my view is that the airline industry is the most interesting place I, I ever worked. I was in the retail business, for example. I was at one point the treasurer of Bloomingdale's and a lot of people in the retail business just love retail. I couldn't be. I couldn't have been less bored. I mean, they thought it was important when men's underwear went from the first floor to the third floor. I could go wow. So I, 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 the aviation business to me was the most interesting business out there. Once again, I would say, find, find, find. What is it that interests you? If, if, if it's a, if, if you, if you like aviation, that's a good place to work. And look, there's going to be a long-term demand for aviation, so you need not worry about the fact that it's going to go away. Yes, we've had a, a, a we've had a bad spell here, and in a commercial sense, aviation has not been a terribly promising place to be. But in terms of making a real contribution to society and having a, a job that changes every day and that puts you in con- contact with lots of interesting people and places, hard to beat. I completely agree. If, if you want something that's hyper competitive, super dynamic, very, uh, you know, awash in data, 
uh, and surrounded by wonderful people. So, uh, it's hard to beat. Terrific. Thank you. Look, uh, Rick, I mean, this has been a fantastic session. Thank you very much for stepping up and and, and moderating the discussion with Bob. Um, You know, I mean, we could, as I said earlier, we could have a whole day session just just talking with you. And I I think that, um, you know, this is, I don't want to take any time away from Bob here uh, in this discussion while we're, while he's been gracious enough to give us his time. But, you know, I also don't want to undersell um, your you know, your career history with American Airlines or the job, um, the very challenging role that you've recently stepped into as head of the Advantage program, of course, at this challenging time. Um, you know, and I don't want to undersell even just the the rapid onset of initiatives that you've deployed in your very short few months already at the helm of the program. But I, we're probably going to have to set up another time uh, to talk about that <laughs> in a lot of detail. But I wanted to, I did have one one more question I wanted to, to fire in there. And that is, Bob, you sort of mentioned when you launched the Advantage program, you know, that the competitors, of course, you know, practically overnight responded. And uh, it's sort of funny, maybe not in a ha-ha sense, but, you know, Rick, I mean, you and I have pl- plenty of discussions with with our colleagues um, over the years where, hey, you know, you can put an American Airlines hat on, a Delta Airlines hat on, a United Airlines hat on. If you're on a loyalty team there, you've had this conversation where the comment is, Whatever we do, the others are going to copy tomorrow. Um, We've even seen initiatives this year where that's happened. Um, So quick questions for the two of you. Um, You know, if you are sitting in a loyalty program, um, you know, at a major airline or another brand where you have this dynamic where whatever you do is going to easily be copied by the competition tomorrow, should that impact your thinking? And should you change strategy because that's going to happen or should you just do what you think is right for your membership base? Yeah. Well, I, I've got a two two part answer or thought to that. One is, hey, if it's a good idea, you don't wait to be disrupted by a competitor. If it's a good idea, you pursue it wholeheartedly. You 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 go you go do it and you do it, you know, better than anybody else. But I think there is such a thing as enduring competitive advantages, which are more cultural. Some things are harder to mimic, and having a culture, for example, that really supports customer service. That isn't something that's easily done nor easily replicated by competitors. And so there are some things you can do. And again, they're not easy things, uh, but things you can do that will have a more long lasting impact and, and set you apart. And, and, and they are worthy of pursuing. Well, my answer would be get on with it, because if you're not the lead dog, the view never changes. Fair call, Bob. Fair call. And I think on, on that note, uh, that wise word of wisdom, um, I, I'm going to say thank you both uh, immensely uh, for your time. Uh, I know you're both very, very busy. Uh, this is great. I, I truly hope that everybody has enjoyed the session. Uh, it's great to be able to have some insights, um, you know, certainly into the history of Advantage here, Bob, as well, um, You know, and obviously to where Advantage is today. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we're all going to be back in person at the Conrad in D.C. on June 30th. We would love to have you both there. So, um, you know, hopefully, again, if the world starts returning back to normal, uh, we'll uh, we'll hopefully be able to get you guys there. We can continue the conversation, maybe go a bit more in depth. Uh, and Rick gives you a little bit more time at the helm to uh, to steer the program through the current challenges. And, you know, maybe we can take stock of, of, of where we are. Thank you so much once again uh, for joining us. Um, please do feel free to hang around if, if time allows during the day, or if not, if you get time to catch the replays of the sessions later or join the networking sessions, I'm sure everybody will appreciate it. Thank you once again to everybody else. We're going to start the next session um, in, in just a second, and we're going to be talking to Jonathan Silva. Um, and if I can just get the slide to come up here, we're going to be talking about advancing a new customer model in loyalty, uh, continuing our conversation from yesterday for those who are part of it. Uh, Bob and Rick, thank you once again, um, and we'll speak soon. Thanks, David. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Bob.